Um, this is really an exciting opportunity for me, or this project of Mining Nature and Elemental Garden. Before I get into the, the meat and potatoes of what this project's been about, um, I had an epiphany this morning, and it involved this black sock. But this is not just any, any ordinary black sock. Can you see the sock? What's it happening? Oh, thank you. I didn't even pay him to say that. But that's true. Did you have chemistry? Okay. How many people on here have had chemistry? How many people are still in chemistry? Yeah, you see, that's what I thought. Maybe you needed to wear the magic socks. But let me just enlighten you a little bit about the magic socks. First, I want to talk to you about two things about this. Uh, first thing I'm going to talk to you about is how I acquired this one periodic table sock because, in a way, it's a metaphor for what this project is about and continues to be. Um, last summer, or this past summer, I received an email from a friend that shared a story with me, and the story goes like this. Um, a very dear friend of hers is a scientist was out in San Francisco at a scientist retreat. This almost sounds like an oxymoron. But anyway, at that retreat, um, the periodic table came up, and this friend of my friend said, I've heard of an artist in Northern Virginia who's doing this very exciting project on the periodic table. And all of a sudden, the scientist sitting across from him pulled up his, his pants, and lo and behold, here he was wearing a pair of the periodic table socks. He immediately took the sock off, handed it to the guy who brought it back home. Luckily, his wife washed it before it was presented to me at my opening. So I looked at this periodic table sock thinking, now what am I supposed to do with one sock? I can't wear it. So I thought, well, obviously there's some kind of message in this. So as I stood there looking at the sock, what started coming up for me was the fact that this sock really represented what chemistry is about. Chemistry is about taking two things, wait, I have another visual, being an artist, <coughs> taking two very different things, and this actually I just acquired a couple days ago, it's a molecule model, and by putting them together, what you're doing is you're creating what's called a molecule, taking two elements together, putting them together to create a whole new thing, and when we start putting things together, they create what we call catalysts. The more and more I started thinking about this, I started realizing, wait a minute, this project that I'm working on is going beyond just the periodic table of elements, which we all took and wanted to forget immediately. And it's become an incredible metaphor. And the metaphor for me of this sock is that there is another human being who is a scientist who, who resides 7,000 miles away from me, who has my mate, my other part of this sock. So in that, for me, is a profound message that through a periodic table sock, we can be deeply connected to another human being. And our connection, even though I don't even know this gentleman, beside the, the fact that I own his other sock, or I'm the caretaker of his other sock, is that we both have an interest in the periodic table. His is the left brain, the, the uh, scientific part, mine is the right brain. So that's the first significant of the sock. Now, for part two. This becomes even more incredible. This sock holds the whole universe in it. At this point, you're probably wondering, is it too late for me to walk out the door? What is this woman talking about? Okay, stay with me for a minute, because this is pretty amazing. This sock contains clouds in it. Can anyone see any clouds in this sock? Anyone? Anyone seeing a cloud in the sock? No? Okay. You are, good. Okay, then you and I are on the same page. Why is there a cloud in this sock? Well, let's think about this sock for a moment. This sock is made out of cotton, I think. Maybe polyester. No, it's telling me cotton. So, cotton comes from the earth. In order to make cotton grow, you need water. And where does water come from? Yes, the clouds. So, therefore, this sock holds the whole universe in it because what it is, is in this, what made this be a sock was the clouds. Well, we can go on forever, and I can probably in about 10 minutes, we can add infinitum, have the whole universe in this sock. And, and I can guarantee you that tomorrow when you put your sock on, you will never think of it or look of it in the same way. Okay. 
All right, let's talk about the real reason why you're here, which is the buying nature and elemental garden. And you will see, hopefully by the end of my presentation, that this sock and what I've just shared with you has a lot to do with this image here. This is a very extraordinary image for me, and personally, because this is an image that I saw in my head about a year ago. And actually, the building that you are sitting in was um, created by the person that helped me manifest this particular drawing, Alec, Alec Deary. What's significant about this drawing for me is the fact that I had this vision of this project that looked just like this. And when I shared it with Alec, he said to me, that can't be done. And I said to him, I know it can be done because I can see it in my mind's eye. He said, all right, I'll tell you what, give me a week and let me see if I can manifest your vision. I'll talk to you more about that as I go on. But what's significant for me is it's all about possibilities. If you don't get anything else from my talk today, I want you to know that sometimes when people tell you you can't do something, but you feel it in your heart, you really need to go forward with it. And that's the way it's been with this project. Three days later, it didn't even take Alec a week, three days later I received a phone call from him and he said, not only can we manifest what you see, it's really magnificent. So, next slide please. My journey with this project happened two, two and a half summers ago when I walked in my house from a lecture trip in Santiago, Chile, and all of a sudden the periodic table came into my consciousness. Periodic table, I had that same response you did when I asked you about it. My God, it seems so long ago, why would it be coming into my head? First I thought maybe it was jet lag. Well, it's not jet lag because if you know anything about South America, there's only a one hour time difference. Now it was a long flight. But anyway, being someone who goes through life rather consciously, I thought, well, you know, there's a reason why this is coming to you. Just investigate it a little bit. So what I did is I just started going on the internet. I just started talking to everyone I knew that had any connection with the periodic table to try to understand its meaning for me and in its meaning for me being able to share it with other people through my teaching and through my art. And this is one of the first images that I saw, and it's an advertisement from Union Carbide from 1960, which is around the time that I was um, taking chemistry, a little bit later than 1960. But it is so reminiscent of that period of time when I was in junior high and high school, because it was a time full of possibilities. And when I look at this image, and when I looked at this image two years ago, I thought, aha, maybe there is another way of looking at this periodic table other than that grid, that rigid, gridded chart. So this was really one of the first images that made me realize there were possibilities. Now you're probably looking at this and thinking, periodic chart, elements, what does this have to do with it? It's got a lot to do with it. This is a beautiful um, mandala-like chart that um, I came across when I was on a journey um, the following fall. I was on sabbatical and I traveled up to India and Bhutan. And I had such a strong feeling there was a reason why I was sent on this journey and it had something to do with the periodic table, but I wasn't exactly sure. What I love about this particular image for me, that's, that figure in the center is, is sort of how I was feeling, you know, doing my research on this project, trying to come up with the meaning of this chart. What's significant about this chart is the fact that it, 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 it represents Eastern cosmologies. And after seeing that, what I started realizing, it was one of those epiphany aha moments that what this was about is what the periodic table is about. It's about the Eastern version, because a periodic table, what it represents, it's not just numbers and letters, but it is a profound cosmology of everything about the universe. Okay, next one. So then when I started realizing and starting to research was I started getting really interested in how different cultures um, create these objects that inform us about things. This particular object is German, it's from the 1600s, 
And back then, before the internet, of course, people needed to create these kind of models to inform them about information. And this is such an incredible pocket globe. I, I, I've seen these in person, only in museums. But it was about the size of an orange, and you would open it up. And when you would open it up, you have all this information that was in the palm of your hand. Now, I know most of you, you get information in the palm of your hand, but it's the iPhone or, or something similar to that. Well, back in the day, before iPhones, this is how people would access information about the world around them. Um, I actually think this is a little more dimensional and sculptural, and it's, it's real, it's not virtual. So, um, for me, these kinds of objects really, really resonate. This one's very interesting because along with talking about the celestial heavens and the earth, it also talks about astrology. And astrology actually was the beginning of astronomy, so it becomes very significant. <clears throat> okay, next, please. Um, this is a, what's called a cosmic mandala, and it's something that I found on my journey to Bhutan. And when I found this, and actually I'm the caretaker of this beautiful object, it's, it's actually pretty small. And this particular, uh, the center of this particular object represents the five elements. So all of a sudden, there I was in the middle of this journey, and I started realizing that other cultures um, investigate the elements, and they, use, they create these forms to, to sort of convey these ideas that are very similar, but yet also parallel to, to us. And I think this is a lot more interesting than the chart, visually, you know. But anyway, so uh, seeing this was quite an epiphany for me. Okay, next, please. This is a, a very famous um, alchemistic mandala. This would be a Western version of a mandala. It's called the Mirror of the Whole of Nature and the Image of Art. And it's from 1617 by an alchemist named Robert Flood. And I had, I had been invited to do some research at the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia, which has one of the premier alchemy collections in the world. And I got to actually hold this in my hand. And it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary in its detail. And what it does, like the other mandalas, it just maps um, in Western version someone's view of the universe without the information of the internet. And you have the angelic realm here, and then you have um, the planets, you have animal, vegetable. And when I saw this, all of a sudden, I knew there had to be some type of profound relationship to what I was seeing in India and its relationship to the West. Okay, next, please. Many of you um, know me. Um, and know that I've spent quite a bit of time in China uh, back in the 80s. And so a lot of my reference to a lot of my own work and to a lot of my own life deals with um, both Chinese and Japanese philosophy. What's very significant about these three forms that you're seeing here is not necessarily the forms, but what these forms represent. In both um, Chinese and Japanese philosophy, the circle represents heaven. The square represents Earth, and one of my personal favorites, the realm that I try to live in, is the triangle, which is 10,000 possibilities. And this is the realm in which, when you live in this realm, all things are possible. When you live in a realm of the triangle, you can see the periodic table as going beyond the rigid gridded chart. Okay, next please. Anyone have any idea what this is? Ever seen it before? seen in math class, philosophy. Has anyone seen it? No one's ever? Oh, that's interesting. It's called the Vesica Pesicus. And um, some believe it's the form, forms the key to understanding the relationship between heaven and earth. But what's so powerful to me about this form is that you can take two circles and you can put them together, and in putting them together, they create the birth of a line. So this is incredibly significant. This creates number three. One, two, three. But with the birth of the line also comes the birth of the triangle. So some people look at the Vesicus as seeing it as a birth canal in terms of birthing the line. So that becomes very significant because with the birth of the line, everything is possible. Okay, next. Okay, um, Michael Mayer. Uh, another alchemist, one of my personal favorites, 
Uh, he is actually considered the first multimedia artist. And what's significant about him, and again, this is 1618, is that he not only did these beautiful engravings and writings about the engravings, but he created a unique view for each one of these. And you'll be hearing one a little bit later on in my presentation. This particular um, image is called Squaring the Circle. And, and what he says in his writing, he says, make a circle out of man and woman, derive from it a square, and a square a triangle, and make a circle, and you'll have a philosopher's stone. I don't know, I saw that, I read that, and I thought, oh my God, this is some kind of major key for what I'm doing. Now, now you have to realize, all of this is being um, uncovered and revealed to me on my own journey to try to get an understanding of what I'm trying to be, what I'm supposed to be doing with the periodic table. Okay, next please. Oh, whoops. Yeah. Okay. So, so here we are. Geometry has something to do with it. I don't know about you. I didn't always have, I didn't have a real positive geometry experience when I was uh, in, in junior high or high school. So the thought that the universe had me come back and revisit this as an adult and take it on was quite magnificent. But I thought, okay, there's a reason why it's coming to me. I really need to investigate it. This is a beautiful engraving. It was um, developed by Kepler, the astronomer. And what's so fascinating about it is he took what's called the platonic solids, which I will talk a little bit more in depth in a couple minutes, um, which are these forms in the center of this square. And he had this vision, and it was an incredible vision. He had this vision of these platonic solids being able to nest inside each other, and he felt that the nesting related to the distance between the planets. Just, just the mere vision of that is so magnificent, unfortunately it was incorrect. But what it has given us is just an absolutely beautiful image. And actually in my own studio at home, um, I have a plastic model, it's called Kepler's Obsession. And I understand why it's called that, because when I tried to put it together, it was one of these kits. It, I, I rate things by martinis, how many martinis it takes to put it together. But this one, and then I called the company and said, oops, you weren't supposed to get that. There's a flaw with it. And so, um, yeah, I, I understood that that was that. Okay, next one, please. The Platonic Solids. Everything goes back to Plato. Why was I even surprised? Um, I assume everyone knows Plato in here, or has heard of him. Plato came up with this concept, and it was based on ancient Egyptian secret writings. And he is actually one of the first people to identify what he calls the first five original elements. And as you can see here, the cube representing Earth, the tetrahedron fire, the isosahedron water, octahedron air, and my personal favorite, the dodecahedron cosmos ether. I had to spend a week just practicing those just to be sure you could get them. Okay, next. So, as you can see, before I got started with my periodic table, I had to go back to the beginning. And I even went back even further than Plato. These are prehistoric. These are 2000 BCE. I, I was astounded because being trained as a sculptor, I know how hard it is to carve anything. But when you see the size of these, they're actually quite small. And when you think that they didn't have pneumatic tools, which are power tools, and everything was done by hand, and you see just the magnificent detail of these, not only the carving, but these beautiful little leather strapping and notations. It, it, it's quite astounding to me. If you, if you want to see these, they're actually up at Hop in Oxford. Um, so if you ever get to England, I, I know it's on my list because I, I want to really check these out. They're just really beautiful. Okay, next. So, I thought to myself, well, before I can start on the periodic table project, i got to build the platonic solids. I have to understand how this works. So, I thought, well, you know, building the solids, that's not going to be hard, but I need to figure out what's inside of those solids. What's in those solids that holds them in that form? So, I did a little Googling, and my Googling came across this image from uh, Plato's Tenius, which is his manifesto on the cosmos. And it was one of those epiphany moments, like, aha, this is what I'm going to do. So next. So what I did 
was I created my own scent, my, my own set of platonic solids. They're actually quite large. I wanted them to hang on the wall because I, at this time I had accepted an invitation to show at this gallery even though I had no clue what I was creating. And the idea of these pieces, next one please. Um, here's the dodecahedron, uh, the cosmos, was to create something that opened. I wanted it to reveal because for me, it was interesting as an object, we all know these as objects, but what's inside the object? You know, it's about the magic that holds that form in tension and compression. And then the final one. This is water, the isosahedron. What holds these in tension and compression? And so it was looking at the tamias that allowed me to understand what Plato was thinking and seeing and try to recreate it some way in my own way. Okay. So then my journey took me on a major investigation of about a year of looking at every periodic table I could find my I could find anywhere. And this is some of the first writings dealing with the periodic table because in the beginning people associated planets with the different metals. And, and this is taken from an alchemy manuscript where you can see some of these. Okay, next. Nice. And then one of my favorites, has anyone ever heard of Diderot? Diderot was a famous encyclopedia creator. And he did the most glorious encyclopedias on all kinds of things having to do with science. And I was able to acquire a copy, a, a, a printed copy, not an actual copy, of the one dealing with, with uh, chemistry. And what you see here at the top is um, an alchemist laboratory, because the alchemists really believe, like I did, all things are possible, but theirs was even weirder than my possibility. They thought they could take urine and turn it into gold. Now, I think if someone did that in this day and age, they'd probably win a Nobel Prize. But um, this is actually an alchemy studio um, that Diderot did in engraving. These are some of the alchemistic symbols that are associated with it. Next. And here's just a close-up of some of these symbols. They're, they're really beautiful. Um, and for anyone that deals with type or uh, anything with typography or graphics, it, it's so interesting to see how symbols, and we see this uh, on the periodic table, um, it is so significant. This is one of the first charts. Um, this is actually Dalton's Elements and Symbols from 1808. And what really struck me, and, and many of my students are here um, in the audience, is I teach design. And, and I'm always interested in how people have this compelling need to take information and to you know, create something with that information so it can be shared with other people. And I just love all these symbols. Um, and it, it's curious like what these symbols might mean. So it was like this whole secret society of, of information. And, you know, we didn't have access to knowing what it was until later on. Okay, next. So what I'm going to show you now is just a series of a variety of different types of uh, periodic tables that informed and inspired my view for this project. This is the traditional Mendeloff table. Um, if you've ever taken a chemistry class, this should look somewhat familiar to you. Uh, I might, I, I want to mention that this week it's very significant that I should be doing this lecture this week because it's the national, it's National Chemistry Week and quite ironically this particular year the theme is it's elemental because it's the 140th anniversary of Mendeloff's discovery of the table which just blew me away because two years ago I had no idea of why that was sent to me and now I understand. I only found this out about six weeks ago. Okay, next. Now I think you're going to really see the periodic table in a way you have never seen it before. Um, people have really, of, of all the icons in science, this is the most iconic um, in terms of people embracing it. Obviously, you can see it on socks, you can see it on glasses, you can see it on everything. But it's, I think you'll find these really interesting, the next one, um, on how people have really taking this icon and really trying to reconfigure it to make it more interesting, more exciting. Next. This is a, a real favorite one of mine, and I'll be talking a little bit about the music of the spheres. But this one I really love. This is 1865. They figured out all of them, and then they went, oops, cobalt nickel, something's wrong. So something wasn't working quite right in this particular chart. 
And I love the fact that they not only put the chart there, but they let you know that, oops, there was a problem. <laughs> so you can see here that, you know, and, and so can you imagine as an artist looking at these and thinking, wow, there's some possibilities here, and I haven't even gotten to that part of my project yet. Next. This one I really like. There's a lot of energy about this one. And um, I, I love it graphically. I just love um, how it's, it's superimposed on another one below it. OK, next. <coughs> this one always reminds me of a board game. And, and I think you know when we create things, and especially the scientists who have created these things, you know, they're full of possibilities too, you know, of, of how you can take a certain finite piece of information and really try to reconfigure it to make it more exciting or more accessible to others. Okay, next. Oh, one of my personal favorites, 1950. This was at a science fair. It was a mural. Can you imagine walking into a sort of a science fair and seeing this thing? I, I, just, I just love it. I love its energy. Next one. And then this one also always feels like it should be a board game. Great moments in chemistry. Okay, next. Oh, not one. The chemical galaxy. I feel a t-shirt coming on here. But anyway, again, what, what the reason I'm, I'm spending this much time showing you this is because I want to show you how you can take a certain amount of information that we always, in our own minds, think of as very rigid and, and very unexciting and how you can shake it up and how you can make it an object of beauty or just something, make us think about it in a very, very different way. Next. <clears throat> this one I just found. Actually, this one I threw in at the last moment because there are certain sites that I go to and this one hadn't been on before. So people are still trying to recreate something that, that we always perceive as very static. This one I really love, uh, not to get graphic, it's gross. When I looked at it, it reminded me of someone sort of severing. It looked like uh, uh, arteries and veins to me when I saw it. But I, I just think it's phenomenal that someone could visualize something that rigid, the chart, and, and turn it into something like this. And then the last one in the series. This one, and this one I want to read you from, this is called the Biodynamic Chemistry Table. And this one says, beginning with the thought that the chemical elements are three-dimensional atoms, yes, and consisting of a nucleus and shells of electrons, the question arises, why not represent the whole periodic table in the same form, a three-dimensional sphere? When I saw that and started thinking about it, it's like, yes, hello, you know, what this represents is not a flat, static thing, it's about everything around us. But from the clothes you wear to us breathing in this room, it's all encoded in this chart. There's something so profound about this chart, at least for me. Okay, next. All right. So I did my research on the periodic table. Now I'm getting ready to start to create. And I, I, I charge myself with creating an installation in a space that is eight-sided octagonal 40 feet. I, I have never really done an installation before, so this was really going to be a challenge. And I needed to come up with a significant um, layout for this universe that I was creating. So what kept coming back in my mind from years of teaching design was the golden mean. It is the most perfect. It represents every single encoded information about everything in nature. It is sacred geometry. So what you're seeing here is the golden bean and this beautiful spiral is called the Fibonacci spiral or Fibonacci sequence. So I thought, aha, that's what's going to be the layout for my project. Next. And then I kept getting this vision of tsunamis. I don't know where that was coming in. So, um, and you can see that that beautiful shape that man has drawn, this Fibonacci sequence, is something that we see in all of nature, whether, you know, it's an El, El Nino like this, or a shell, or petals and flowers, that it's something that's inherent in nature. Okay, next. So, that, that gave me the idea of the layout for this project. So Alec Deary, who built the building that we're sitting in today, um, 
I called and I asked him if he would like to join me on this journey. And he said, absolutely. And he came over to my studio. I told him what I was seeing in my head. And he said, no, that can't be done, but give me some time. So what we did first is, at the top, what you're seeing is we plotted all 83 elements, because I just determined I was going to deal with the first 83 naturally occurring elements. And we plotted them just for scale. And you can see the very smallest one is hydrogen to the right, and all the way to the left, the largest one is number 83, which is this piece. Then what we decided to do is we plotted each of the eight columns, uh, each of the elements of the eight columns on its own line. And what we noticed is number two uh, column, that had the most elements. And then uh, what you're seeing here is Alex sort of playing around with possibilities of how it could be set up. He was really not going with my idea because he said, no, that's not going to work. But then three days later, he got it to work. And this is what it looks like on paper um, in the gallery. It had to actually be altered once we got it to the gallery. But this, this was um, the first generation of what it was going to look like. Next, please. Okay, here's a close-up where you can see him working out the ideal. This is the gray space, Greater Reston Art Center space. And this is what it's looking like placed in that space, just on paper. Next. So, what happened in my investigation with um, looking at all these periodic charts, I found this chart, and for some reason it really resonated with me. And it resonated with me because they look like flowers. And I thought, this is perfect. I'm going to create a garden um, of these atom flowers. And you know, when you think about a garden, a garden is about meditation. It's about transformation. It's about life, death. Um, and I'm going to create a garden of these flowers. Next. So what happened was, um, for this particular um, a, a, you know, periodic table, what I was able to do next was to convert these in my studio. What you're seeing now is me taking each one of these shapes, um, cutting them out, and you can see behind me, my whole studio was filled with these flowers. I mean, it, it, it was pretty unbelievable thinking that you were building the universe in your basement. And it was always so much fun when people walked walk down the basement because they go, <gasps> I mean, it just, I mean, when you see these just filling your basement, it's pretty amazing. Okay, next. So this was one of my first prototypes. One of my personal, absolute personal uh, elements is carbon. And carbon is such a magical element because it's number six. Now, six is a, it's always been a lucky number for me. But what makes it more incredible is what carbon represents. Carbon represents diamonds. It also represents graphite. So it's light and dark. So it, it's the whole cycle of life in one element. Okay, next. So this is the, um, the drawing that Alec did that really allowed me to start visualizing what this was going to look like in the space. And once I saw this, I knew I was on the right track. Okay, next. And this is what the actual installation looks like in the gallery at this particular moment. One of the um, obstacles, and, and anyone that knows me knows that I'm a strong believer in crisis opportunity. So my crisis was this column. And that dealer, and the, the curator kept saying, you've got to deal with that column. It's not going away. You cannot remove it for your exhibition. So one day I came in, I noticed there was a little hole in the column, and I had my little number six with me. And I popped it in that hole, and I thought, oh my god, this is perfect. So starting with hydrogen and helium, the, the lowest atomic number elements come down, they spiral down around the column, and they spiral back on the floor. And what, and what was so amazing, they spiral in one direction. When they hit the floor, then they spiral out in the other direction. It, it's, it's pretty incredible. And this was from the person that said it couldn't be done. OK, next. Here's another view um, looking back into a smaller gallery where I had the where I have the platonic solids hanging. Next. And this is uh, an installation shot of uh, two of the platonic solids, the dodecahedron, um, ether, and then earth uh, next to it. There's a little bit more space that the image is a little deceiving. And next. And then um, air, which is uh, another one of the the elements that are on there. And again, this whole idea of wanting to open these up to reveal. Okay, next. Now, 
This is when you when when I came down into my studio one day, or actually I was walking up from my studio one day. I had this vision. I had this view of what you're seeing now. And next. And all of a sudden, I had this incredible memory of this trip I was on in Burma, in Bagan, looking at these temples. And all of a sudden, it was this extraordinary epiphany. Oh my God, these things are all interconnected. Next. And you can see that there was this relationship of these forms that I was creating that represented these atom flowers to these temples, to these temple layouts. Of course, it's all based on sacred geometry. You know, there's this divine numerical system that we have in our universe that relates to the smallest molecule up to the largest thing in outer space. It's, it's pretty magnificent. Okay, next. And here you see this is one of the layouts of one of these temples, um, one of the temples that I just showed you. And you can see the same layering effect that I was, you know, had come across in terms of my own investigation of building, building the elements for this particular exhibition. Next. And it's that same divine order that you see in the peddling systems of flowers. If you cut open some lettuce or cut open some cabbage, you, you see that same layering of, of divine proportions. It doesn't matter whether it's a temple or a head of lettuce. It's inherent in all nature. And it goes all the way far out into the reaches of um, deep space. That's how powerful it is. And, and we can see this through you know, instruments that allow us to see the spiral. Okay, next. So at a certain point, I built all this, I built this universe in my basement, and I, and I had such a strong feeling I needed sound. Now, I know nothing about sound except that I played the accordion when I was in sixth grade. And that was not a successful experience. But I just felt like I needed to find someone to collaborate with me on this part of my journey. And this particular uh, very, very beautiful um, image is another Robert Flood from 1617 called The Music of the Spears. And, and when I saw that image, I knew that I had to have sound. So I started doing some research on what sound is about. And what my research um, revealed, it's about vibration. And anything that moves creates a vibration. So it doesn't matter whether it's an atom that we can't really see, but there's this vibration that is set up. And what's very interesting, um, let me get the date on this. In 1787, Ernest Chandelani was one of the first people to investigate scientific acoustics. And what that means is he had this plate, and what he did is he covered it with sand, and then he took a violin bow and he started striking the plate with this violin bow. And all of a sudden he started noticing as the plate was vibrating, it was vibrating and creating different patterns. So what it was doing, the sound was creating visual patterns. And all of a sudden I just started realizing, oh my God, I really do need to put some sound element into what I'm doing. Next. Right on to thank you. Um, this, we're back to Robert Merrigan. I told you we would revisit him again. And this is actually one of these beautiful fugues. Okay. One of these beautiful fugues for this particular image. So can you imagine not, not only seeing an image, but being able to hear the image? And I was very fortunate when I was at Chemical Heritage Foundation. They had an actual hand-colored first edition copy of this book along with the recording. And it was magnificent to go through these, listen to, look at them, and listen to each one of the views for them. So he is considered the first multimedia artist. Okay, so as I'm preparing for this lecture um, today, I'm doing some research to find out a little bit more about this specific engraving, and all of a sudden, the internet in its in its universal whatever, sent me this image. It was so powerful, I could not believe it. Not only was it the image I was researching, but it was the Fibonacci se the sequence overlaid on it. And I, I, I was just so in awe that, you know, that I had to include it. Because so much of this, this project was about connections, interactions, things that didn't seem to be connecting, connecting all coming together in this project. Okay, next. 
Okay, unfortunately, um, Susan Alexander, who was on the bill with me today, uh, my collaborating partner um, on the sound component, could not be here. So what I decided to do was to bring her a little bit of her presence here through her information about her. Um, if you go on her website, oursounduniverse.com, you'll find out all information about her. I had researched trying to find the perfect person to collaborate on this project. And about a year later, my research brought me to her, and she considers herself a bio musician. She's basically doing what I'm doing, but with sound, and I could not believe it. Not only that, this woman lives in Portland, Oregon. She's almost as far as the sock, where the sock came from. But what's even more incredible than that, we share the same birthday. I think that's pretty amazing. Okay, next. I'm a woman of deep connections. But anyway, this is Susan, who I've never met. I've only talked to her on the phone every single day and email, but this is her. And she can't be with you, but she's here in spirit and in this image. Thank you. Next. And what's very interesting is both of us have this incredible um, passion for this invisible world that, we, that our work, work both finds us in. And if you think about the elements, all the elements come from deep space. Because with Big Bang, Big Bang threw everything that we have on Earth now from outer space to where we are at this moment. So we, both of us, feel in this realm. So, and I love this particular image because it felt like we were twins, you know, in this, in this particular venture. Okay, next. Um, I'm going to read this only because this is so beyond a lot of my understanding. This information here, what you're hearing, is based on her first investigations with the elements. She investigated the first six elements, hydrogen, phosphorus, carbon, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen. Through certain software and these little more frequencies, she is able to convert the vibrations that come from the nucleuses of these elements into tones. And this is what she uses to create her sounds. I highly recommend if you want to know more about it, to please go on her site. There's some wonderful essays about it. But this music's amazing. This music is created from the nucleuses of that. I, I just find that just extraordinary. And this particular thing that you're hearing now is based on just these six original elements. Again, this is the first time I saw what she looked like because you know I've only talked to her on the phone. She did want me to tell you that this is not her home studio because she thinks this looks a little depressing. But this is a studio at, at a college where she was teaching out, I think, Cobsdale, um, out in uh, Sunnyvale, California. Okay, so she wanted me to make that very clear in this presentation. Okay, next. We'll get some sound with this. That should be coming up. What you're seeing here is what she's seeing when she's creating her music. You know, this isn't sitting down with an instrument playing music. This is using science and electronics to create the sound. I have to tell you, when, I, when she just sent me this image and I listened to this, and this is her soundtrack for my piece, I could visually see her map each and every one of these sounds. It was, it was extraordinary to me. There's something about looking at something and hearing it that just adds so much to, to an experience. And I kept thinking of myself working in my own studio with my hands and her with all these vibrations and buttons and you know, I'm not a big computer tech person, but obviously she is and she's able to finesse and create this beautiful music out of things from the heaven and from the earth. It's extraordinary to me. Okay, next please. We'll come back to that music. This is another one of the screens and with her notations. Um, and again, just very interesting to me being able to map something that we can't actually see but she needs to map it so she can compose with it. Okay, next. 
Another aspect, and we're coming to the end, and, and I don't want to talk longer because I see people sort of nodding off a little bit, but anyway, um, at a certain point I really felt that dance needed to be brought into this dialogue as well, and I contacted uh, Jane Franklin, who deals a lot with artists and contemporary dance, and she will be doing a performance on Wednesday at the Greater Rest and Arts Center um, using what I've created um, as a set for her dance. And if we, and, and, and this particular image, I found this particular image because um, it relates to sacred geometry and how certain cultures have certain movements in them that heightens the sense of understanding of sacred geometry. Okay, next. This, the next series of images are some of uh, Jane Franklin's dancers in my studio interacting with my sculpture. And, and it was so thrilling for me to see this because up until this point it was just me and the elements in the basement hanging out. And to see people interacting with them in a different way was just extraordinary for me. Okay, next. And this is, these are just some images of them. And this was very impromptu. This, I mean, this wasn't you know, worked out or anything like that in, in the last one. And I, I was just, I was really moved at how these, these women just responded to what I had created. And that sort of activated it on another level. So Jane's dance performance will involve my installation plus Susan's sound and then the dance. So that I feel will fully activate it even more. Okay, and the last image, or second to last image, I just want us to take about two or three minutes. Um, this is the actual installation and you'll hear Susan's sound. And just so you can, if you don't have an opportunity to go out and see it, just take two or three minutes for us to listen to it and just experience what it's about. I would encourage you to go up, if, if you have an opportunity, to the Greater Resident <coughs> Art Center to visit this. It, it, I, have, I have been creating art for a really long time, but I have never created anything um, where people have really had this extraordinary experience. I mean, it doesn't matter whether they're younger or older. I, I've gotten reports from people that it's, it's just this extraordinary experience for them. So I encourage you to please go up if you have an opportunity up to rest in and, and experience for yourself. You can walk into it. I've had people come in and meditate in it. I've had people laying in it. I've had people laying on their bellies. I mean, it's really, I've been in awe of how people have interacted with, with this um, project that I've created. And then the final slide, one of my personal favorites, we're back to Albany again. The universal diagram for the formation of questions about every possible question. And with that, I ask if anyone has any questions. <laughs> and thank you for being a wonderful audience. <laughs> yes, oh good. I was uh, yes, you talked about sounds and pictures, about hearing and, 
and seeing about synesthesia. Synesthesia can be understood in the very narrow context of cognitive psychologists associating input from different senses, but it can be also considered in the context of Leonardo da Vinci and his concept of synesthesia, which is much more interesting and much more complicated. And he understood synesthesia as a key to human creativity, including engineering creativity. And of course, that also included thought, uh, input from all our senses, and creating the state of the mind when you actually move to a different quality and produce novel solutions, designs, or inventions in engineering. So, from this point of view, I'd like to thank you as an engineer, but it was meaningful for me to listen to this interpretation, and it could be used also in training students, educating students how to become more creative and not necessarily in the area of art. Well, thank you. That, that, that means a lot to me. I, I really appreciate your feedback. What I have gleaned um, with my own life journey is that the educational system it segregates all of us, and, and it's, it's really been challenge, challenging for me as a professor and as an artist. Sometimes I feel very alienated, so what I try to do is use my work as a voice to start bringing, collaborating with other people, and to, to show people that all these things are interconnected. I mean, that was the whole reason and the joy of putting this presentation together, and thank you for affirming that. It means a great deal to me. Thank you. Yes? I have a mundane question. What kind of uh, paper or materials? Materials. That's not a mundane question in this group. Um, I've been working with mylar, frosted mylar, probably for about 15 years. And most people that know my work, I paint, I use it as a, a painting substrate. But with this particular project, I wanted people to really focus um, on the shape. So I didn't want to add any kind of coloration to it. The other thing that's very extraordinary, this particular gallery is fronted by windows. So at different times of the day, they illuminate. Sometimes they're like orbs of light. It is so extraordinary. They sort of harness the light. And the other thing that's very magical about them is they change, like everything in nature, depending on how much or how little light. And for me, um, it's really fun to go at different times of the day because you get very different experiences and feelings about it because it's always in flux, like everything else in nature. Yes? I'm interested in the sense of like sacredness or you know the issue of spirituality. I mean, you showed the the temples in Burma, mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested in how people, in a sense, worship science or or maybe you know how that becomes a divine sense of order for people. Who, you know, does that does that play, play in your own work? Oh, very, very much so. Um, I had always wanted to be a scientist, but I'm so, so severely dyslexic. I have a lot of learning challenges. That wasn't my life path. But um, in lecturing, I had the opportunity to lecture to 75 physicists uh, in, in 2005 about my work. And what I gleaned was the fact I got the best of both worlds because I don't have the rules that scientists have. You know, I, I get to use science as my muse but then I can interpret it any way I want. And so for me, I feel it's the best of both worlds. I think sometimes um, I've been around enough scientists to know, uh, unfortunately, they have to sort of justify every single thing they do, and it has to follow a certain type of procedure and protocol for it to be legitimate. But in art, you know, you can take it and interpret it. And, and I find, for me, it's very exciting. And I find that scientists find it exciting too to be able to see something that they know in one way and see it interpreted in another way. Yes? Your um, sculptural forms, the flowers you said, mm -hmm. were the difference between the different levels, were they based on the atomic numbers of the elements they were based on? Thank you, that's an excellent question. And I, and I might not have covered that as much as I should have. Um, the shapes that you're seeing are based on the orbital patterns of the 83 naturally occurring elements. And I decided to work with the orbital patterns because, you know, obviously being someone who teaches design, I'm very interested in shapes and forms. And it's the part, the electron, the orbital pattern is one of the most elusive parts of the atom. We don't really see it unless we have high-powered, you know, devices that allow us to see it. So it's very ethereal. 
And, and it's also the form that moves the fastest. I mean, moving so fast we can't even see it. And they, they refer to it as an orbital cloud. It, it creates a cloud. And a lot of people have seen these pieces and they look very cloud-like. So I think on an intuitive level, something directed me to select that material and use it in that way for that reason. Any other questions? You're going to let me get off that easy? <laughs> well, thank you very much. You've been a wonderful